will start by talking about occupational science and the connection with occupational therapy in my experience. Um, I think that occupation is a foundation for occupational therapy. This is basic knowledge for us to understand the occupational part of our name. And when occupational science started, I guess uh, you know, 30, maybe 40 years ago, we began to see that knowing about occupation gave us more knowledge and depth of understanding of daily life to bring to the practices of occupational therapy. So um, you have notes here about defining terms and occupation, human occupation, I think in the very simplest term, is um, referring to what we do every day, but also not just what we do, but why, uh, how, where, when. So there are questions uh, in defining occupation, human occupation, that relate to time and place and uh, uh, forces in our context that determine what we do, limit what we do, give us opportunities. So all of this knowledge, I think, has helped to deepen, uh, both deepen and also broaden our understanding of the kind of therapies that we might offer. have a list of some terms around human occupation that I think are important. And so, for instance, I have been very interested with Dr. Ann Wilcock about occupational justice and occupational injustice. And in the simplest way, we began to ask questions. What are we going to talk about if people are deprived of occupation? So. If we have people who have medical conditions and they cannot engage in some occupations, or if they are living in poverty and they are marginalized, so people on the streets and they are unable to participate in work occupations, so they're marginalized or alienated because they are in a workshop where they do things every day that are meaningless. And the imbalance that uh, means that some people are so busy in what they do and yet there are other people, old people in nursing homes are a classic example, sitting with nothing to do. So it was in understanding what happens to people and their occupations that we began to give some terms to occupational justice, occupational deprivation, occupational marginalization, occupational alienation occupational imbalance. So that's how I look at those terms. They are ways to describe what's happening in people's lives. And the terms immediately draw us to look at the context of their lives and the context of our practices to understand why they are deprived, why they are marginalized. So then we need to understand those political and geographical and social and other forces that determine possibilities for occupation. Now let's think about uh, the examples of how the knowledge of occupation that occupational science is bringing can be used in clinical practice. I'll use the example of working with older people. And you might be working with older people in an actual older person's residence or home. But maybe you are working with older people in their own homes. So we would go in with an occupational science lens, you might say, or an occupational lens, and we wouldn't start by saying, oh, how are your hands or your range of motion, or can you stand and walk around, but instead we would go in and say, what are you doing 
Let us look at the daily um, combination of occupations and your schedule and what choice do you have. So you have many older people who are caught in the nursing routine, for instance. So they have to get up at the same time as everybody because the nurses have to get the beds made. And they don't have a choice about getting dressed then. Maybe they don't have a choice that they would like to make their bed because the nurse says, oh, it has to be made this way. And then to eat something in the morning, do they have a choice of the kind of food that they might have enjoyed throughout their life? No, some of them are having to go to a dining room and they all eat the same thing, whether that's what they grew up with or not. So I think our occupational science and uh, occupational lens allows us to ask what people are doing every day, how is it organized in terms of schedule, what choice do you have, where can you do your occupations, can you actually go out to visit somebody um, if you are living in a care facility or even in your own home, do you have transportation or are you stuck until somebody says, oh I will come and take you for a drive, but maybe you don't want to go for a drive that afternoon. So it's that knowledge of how important occupation is and we should ask the questions about occupation and is your life meaningful? Do you have something meaningful to do? So that would be how I would think about occupational science in working with older people who are very vulnerable to somebody caring for them and removing their choice, removing their opportunities and standardizing how everybody has to live in a particular place. Uh, if I was thinking about applying it to children who are in school and have special needs, then I would bring my occupational perspective again to say, how did those, what are the occupations for those children at home and, and how are they able to fulfill a meaningful life? at school. Most recently, my two projects are related to older people and children. Um, one is a research project to listen to older women who live in a rural part of Canada to find out what helps them and what limits them from having a meaningful life. So we're not looking at, you know, do you have to use a walker or do you have a chronic disease? Yes, many of them would have that. But the real question is, do you have a life that is still meaningful for you? And so we are collecting data as a research project um, using a method called photo voice. So you interview them, but they also give you a picture of something that is meaningful. So, you know, one lady has a picture of her car because it's meaningful to be able to get out of her home. So that's one way of bringing occupational science thinking into research. The other one is with children and uh, concern for social inclusion in primary schools. And actually, that's a project that is taking me from Canada to rural Kenya. And um, actually have worked with an occupational therapist who is in the community. And she can help to go to the school, assess how many children have special needs. And then we are trying to think in the rural area with very few resources, how can we create a context for these children to have a meaningful occupation, meaning um, meaningful occupations to learn and complete their education. So those are two examples of bringing occupational science into uh, practice and research where although I might know, for instance, about children and I could, I guess, assess their cognitive abilities and so forth, my focus to start is on can you participate in school? Are you included? What ways are you excluded? And then we think more about the environment, not so much about fixing them, 
Now we are talking about teaching occupation, and I suppose teaching and also learning occupation. And I want to give an example from my university, which is Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on the east coast of Canada. And one example is that at this World Federation of Occupational Therapists Congress in South Africa, we have 16 students from our um, entry to practice class, which is at the master's level, 16 students and five faculty, and we have field trips, plus they are attending the conference, and we have um, debriefing sessions, reflective comments, we have WhatsApp all organized for that group, and they will go back and they will complete the assignments, and they will, they will complete a, a, a course for credit by participating in this kind of world event. So that's one way to actually engage them in seeing how occupation is being used in occupational therapy through their field trips, but also through the papers that they are listening to. And in the university itself, uh, there might be field trips where they analyze the occupations. They have some exercises to analyze their own occupations and to um, consider the occupations of certain populations, whether they're people with stroke and what happens to your occupations with stroke. So many exercises where they are challenged to think about occupations and to understand how occupational science is part of their knowledge base uh, before they jump into thinking of a solution as a therapy. So occupation is that basic knowledge that gives us a particular way of looking at the world, looking at individuals, but looking at populations and groups, you know, so are the homeless people uh, getting opportunities for housing, so looking at that level, not just at one person at a time. So that's how we're trying to teach occupation. It's a more population focus, not so much individual. In other words, you hear me saying that I think occupational science is incredibly important for occupational therapy, and I wish you well in learning about it. So I think for me, occupational science has been uh, perhaps most fundamentally important in, in reviewing and bringing back into practice the concept of occupation. So if we think about where occupational therapy was in the early, the late 1970s and early 1980s, certainly in the UK where I was located, but also I think in America there was a real biomedical focus on di medical diagnoses and activities and techniques such as sensory integration and biomechanical approaches um, and I don't think it's by chance that occupational science was uh, being developed at that time and then we saw this re-emergence of occupation based practice, occupation as a focus of practice, as an aim of practice. So I think it's enabled us to expand practice, to consider occupational needs of people beyond medical needs. Um, so we can talk about somebody who is in a position of occupational deprivation, for example, uh, occupational imbalance, but also this idea that fundamentally we are dealing with people's occupational needs which may be influenced by a medical diagnosis but is not the core of our practice. Um, and so I think it's also in those terms then helps define our practice in terms of other professions and helps identify our core expertise 
I think that it certainly can can be expanded over the next few years. And how do we how do we interview about occupational needs? How do we practice directed at in influencing needs both with individuals, families, communities? Um, and how do we publicise that, disseminate that information to service providers, governments, have it introduced into policy? So I think when I'm talking about occupational needs, I'm certainly basing those ideas on Wilcox's uh, theory of occupation, the, the article that she published in 1993, when she talks about uh, the need of people to do for survival, uh, the need of people to, to be engaged in occupation in order to use their capacities and to use their abilities. Um, so with students, I use the I ask them if they've ever spent a, a lengthy period of time, perhaps in in bed because of an illness, and how does that make them feel? And that urge that we get to, oh, I'm, I I've been sitting for too long. I need to get up and do something. Or um, you know, people want to um, to read a book and, and to gain knowledge. Um, I think there's a we. We often don't think about how much we're driven by a sort of a physical or mental sense of of a need, a lack that we have, and also um, I think the need that we have to be um, uh, for enjoyment and for pleasure and for satisfaction and whether that and for our for expression. We need to express ourselves through relationships, through conversation, through music, through art through creative forms but also through for cooking a meal for our family we're also expressing and engaging in a, in a relationship with people so i think there's a there's multiple needs that um, we have to be engaged in the world and some of those are from our own internal needs uh, to satisfy hunger to satisfy to, war, to be warm to to use our skills but also obviously to address uh, demands of the environment People, people demand things of us in a positive sense, whether it's our children or relatives to be cared for, or the work we're in demands certain behaviours. So, but needs primarily for me are internal, and I think a lot of our occupation comes from those needs. So, going back or looking a little bit more at what is occupation, I think. Uh, I know there's an enormous debate about that in the, in the literature uh, and has changed throughout time, I think, our perception of occupation, but uh, where I think we're at at the moment and where I think is most useful is actually to think of occupation as everything that we do. Um, those things can be positive for us, so and those are the ones we usually look at when we're helping client or a patient reconstruct their life to support their health and well-being, but occupation can also be more negative um, for somebody. Uh, so that could be uh, an occupation of, of perhaps working too much uh, or um, obviously say misuse of alcohol or drugs or, or different things like that. But I think um, if, if, we, if we think of occupation as everything, um, from having a conversation with somebody to taking a call on a mobile phone to patterns of occupation over long periods of time. That then helps us think about more clearly, but what are the parts, how do we understand the occupation that supports health and well-being? And <clears throat> some of that is very fundamental around survival needs. We have to be able to eat, drink, clothe ourselves, have friendships, have families, all those elements. Um, it may be things about meaning, though that's again a very complicated concept, um, because actually everything has some kind of meaning, and meaning can be negative. It's very meaningful to, to be in abusive relationship, but it's not health promoting. So again, what sort of meaning is, is helpful? Um, purpose, all these terms, then then we can start to think about what is it in our culture, in our context, that supports people's health and well-being in what they do. Um, I think the other thing that helps if we think about occupation as everything is that we can see it as a very fluid process, 
goes on throughout life. We have moments when we are perhaps less balanced. You know, if a student are revising for examinations, they may be working seven hours a day, or somebody's trying to finish a thesis, it's a very intense period of work. But we know that in a month or in two months, we'll be able to go on holiday, we'll be able to do other things that will be restorative. And that's a very natural balance, and we feel that in our lives. We spend <coughs> these five days at a conference, it's very busy, it's very intense. We then have this period of quiet, and it balances it out. Um, so I think fluidity across the time, across our lifespan, um, and occupation being everything is a really good starting point. Firstly, thinking of occupational justice, um, which I understand to be thinking about how occupation is distributed um, across populations and people and contexts, and whether that's in a just way in the sense of social justice and distribution. Um, and I, in in clinical applications, that seems to be useful in two, um, perhaps, ways at the moment in, in the United Kingdom. One is regarding particular um, groups of people, for example, in the prison system, people living in care homes, uh, people living in poverty, uh, refugees, to what degree is their ability to engage in occupation impacted by social conditions beyond their control. Um, and that's been useful, I think, for um, occupation therapists working in the clinical areas to begin to see their practice in terms of not the individual, um, but also what's the systems and how are they working. So whether that's, you know, how, are, how do care homes organize their daily activities for people and how can that be expanded to be more individualized or richer or more available because there are sometimes cases where very little is provided. Um, and I think the other place where there's an occupation focus and thinking about everything as an occupation is very useful is in conditions such as alcohol misuse and if we start thinking about drinking as an occupation uh, that helps us then analyse, well, what are the conditions under which uh, drinking, and I'm certainly not talking about stopping drinking, but about at what point does that become problematic for somebody. Um, we're looking into moments of transition for older people, perhaps moving into retirement or returning into um, bereavement or loss in older age. And how does that seem to be triggering alteration in an occupational pattern that has been helpful up to that time? So thinking of drinking alcohol as a pattern that can be, can be health promoting and it can also be quite damaging. What, when does that change occur and how does it occur? And I think some of our work from occupational science is really valuable in understanding how people um, develop and shape their, their occupations at particular times and how that can change in the same way perhaps for people with eating disorders. We all eat, we all prepare food. How does it become a, 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 a non-health promoting occupation? Um, so I think that um, that I that those are two two particularly useful examples certainly in the occupational therapy context of the United Kingdom at the moment. Okay, so the first example of some of my research around ideas of, of occupational science and occupation I'd like to mention is um, my doctoral research that I conducted when I was living in Greece and that was I think very much about what is occupation and is occupation a universal concept. I, it was um, in teaching in, in the Greek context I was very much challenged sometimes by trying to translate not just literally into the Greek language but also into the Greek uh, culture and context um, some of the concepts around occupation so what is meaning uh, we wouldn't really talk about mean, mean we wouldn't use the word for meaning in Greek in the same way as it is in, in the English language so 
to what does that mean for, for our understandings of occupation. Um, and it was, I, I was looking at occupation in the general population, what is occupation, how do we understand daily life, but and particularly around how do we live healthy daily lives, because at that time I felt that a lot of occupational science theory was around what are healthy daily lives, how is occupation linked to health, so those were the interests. And from that research, um, I think there were three things that maybe just very briefly are of interest. One was um, regarding uh, that occupation was taking place at three levels simultaneously for most people. One was to do with the self and the person themselves. One was to do with the family and how they occupation in relation to family members, family networks, family occupation, and the third level was in occupation in relation to the collective, to the public space of the community. Um, and people were engaged in occupation at all those three levels. Um, and even in relation to the, the, the self, um, the self was conceptualized quite clearly, not in terms of just the, the physical self and the body that needed care, which obviously is part of sort of what how perhaps the Canadian model would describe self-care, um, but it was also to do with the, the soul and the spirit and how do we take care of our emotional needs um, and how do we take care of our spiritual needs and what do we do for those. And then family, care, cousins, children, parents, lots of doings and beings in relation to those people and then in the public space of being a citizen, being part of that group. Um, um, and that in some ways links to some uh, another area of interest which I think is this idea of the public space and citizenship, um, which is work we're doing with a, a group from the European, uh, from ENOTE, um, and that's looking at not citizenship as a uh, the relationship between the individual and the state, as that can be um, named with a, a passport and, and identity documents, but to do with the relationships of fellow citizens between each other and sort of mutual responsibility for how we live together and the public world that we create. Um, and I think that's very interesting for occupational therapy too, because I think Certainly in the UK, we tend to focus on even people with long-term disabilities and medical conditions. We're often very interested in their personal um, occupations to do with self-care, to do with going back into employment. But we less re frequently look at um, how are they involved in the public world. Are they able to be part of um, celebratory events? Are they able to go to a football match or to a, to a, a club, at, in, in, which would be a sort of celebratory collective occupation in, in certainly urban society in Northern Europe? Or are they able to be part of a local association that's, or, or local government? You know, are they able to take on roles and responsibilities around the, the public world? So this idea of citizenship, I think, is very useful too. Um, also for working with communities, um, the idea of working together as fellow citizens uh, and perhaps also as a useful perspective to think of in terms of client-centred. Are we, if we're client-centred, but our first time as a fellow citizen with my client. So what does that mean for our relationship as people in the world together before we enter into this potential power dynamic of I have the expertise and the client is being treated. But that's a probably a different story. And um, the final bit of research that I'm involved in, which I think uh, hopefully will be interesting, is looking at um, occupation at uh, a social level and how we can transform communities or policy to, uh, to tackle issues of discrimination and inequality, poverty, and there we're, we are um, interviewing various people involved in occupation-based projects because we do feel that occupation is a mechanism for change, whether that's on an individual basis or whether it's on a collective basis. Um, so the potential, for example, I've just recently interviewed a, a project that's used football with homeless people and through the occupation of 
playing football and becoming football players, they are able to re-engage with aspects of society that actually had rejected them for many years and become more organised and find skills and gain confidence and act as role models in the communities that they were coming from of quite deprived areas. Um, so we see there the power of occupation to enable change both at the individual level but also at the community level and those, those um, cases will be um, uh, published in the next year or so. Um, giving examples of uh, occupation-based social transformation. I'll talk first about our undergraduate programme uh, that we have at the university. And occupation is very much a thread throughout the whole of the programme. And in fact, when we were designing the programme, we had sort of across years what's going to happen each year, but then we also had some horizontal, a vertical threads, and one was occupation. How is it going to be introduced? How will it be sort of ensured that it's there the whole time? So we, the, the, the students in their first year, we have a whole module, um, which is called the occupational, um, uh, humans as occupational beings. Uh, which they take in the first year as a, a module and they look at their own occupations and they have to give a talk about an occupation that they engage with. We ask them to keep, make a portfolio recording the, an occupation that they do and reflecting on what that means for them and presenting it in quite a creative way usually. Um, we talk about how to develop an occupational profile of somebody, how to get to know somebody as an occupational being, how to hear stories about their lives and we ask them to do that with a friend or a relative. So we spend quite a lot of time looking at people as occupational beings before we look at people as with medical conditions or people who they're going to come in contact and work with. And, and then really we start, when those are introduced um, and we do talk about medical conditions and we talk about neurological issues and mental illness but we uh, we are often looking at the impact of those in terms of occupations so what would that that condition mean for this person as an as an occupational being um, and and the work with them uh, <coughs> being around occupation occupation as a medium for for intervention as well as a, as a, a goal um, we always expect their assignments. We usually they usually have written assignments or presentations, and we would be expecting those to be always have an occupation focus um, as a sort of core requirement. So somebody who just came and talked about cardiac problems and exercise without any reflection or relation to occupation would not probably pass the assignment. So that's a core criteria. Um, so we're always looking at occupational therapy through an occupational lens. We do do work around uh, occupational deprivation. We very much present difficulties with occupation around as um, either occupational deprivation or occupational disruption. So often medical illnesses we frame as a disruption um, and then more the long-term societal influences as deprivation. And we use those sort of two terms as framings of the kind of things that we may be working with as occupational therapists. Um, we also have a master's programme. Um, we have one module there which is on occupational science, um, which is an introduction to all the key concepts around occupational science. And the final assignment is uh, asking them to take uh, a current issue in society that influ is influencing the health or well-being of populations and to look at it through the lens of an occupational science concept. So they might look at um, loneliness in, 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 as a societal problem and look at it through the perspective of it could be belonging or it could be um, occupational deprivation or it could be alienation. They can choose what what's the lens that they would bring to that. Um, and we have a, that then is followed by a second module where they <coughs> really 
because and that's where they will be the students taking that module will be occupational therapists so we encourage them to what would changing your practice to have an occupational focus look like <coughs> what are the challenges to that so critiquing modules models critiquing theory and the mm -hmm. final the final assignment is suggesting change Occupational science is guiding research in occupational therapy in so far as it's the research in occupational science has developed a lot of the concepts and constructs that we now are testing in terms of understanding the application of them in occupational therapy practice. So, and I have written about this, the occupational science research agenda has really been about advancing our understandings of occupation as a complex, situated phenomenon, and then taking different aspects of it and, and different core constructs like occupational adaptation, occupational deprivation, topic dear to my heart, and providing I guess the conceptual scaffolding through which those understandings can be further developed through a range of research approaches. I've always argued that as well, that occupation is so complex we need to have a pluralist approach to the methodological strategies that we use. So I see that in the time that occupational science has been around and has been developed, it's had a major impact on the research agenda and research topics of interest in occupational therapy. Occupational deprivation is a topic that I've been very interested in for possibly about over 20 years and my interest in occupational deprivation really came from working closely with Anne Wilcock. Uh, she was my PhD supervisor and really assisted me with some of the early conceptual development on occupational deprivation. The reason that I'm interested in occupational deprivation is because I think it's one of the most serious and, and pervasive problems that we face around the world. And since I started thinking and writing and, and researching about occupational deprivation, actually, I think more people in the world are probably being exposed to scenarios of occupational deprivation, particularly, for example, people who are displaced, people living in refugee camps, but increasingly the numbers of people in institutional care, prisons, aged care facilities. So it's, it's, a big, it's a big issue. I think occupational deprivation has helped us, the research so far has helped us understand the experience of occupational deprivation and the impacts of occupational deprivation. In particular, how they really erode people's capacities, their quality of life, their ability to have a sense of agency. But there's still a lot more work to do in researching occupational deprivation. I think that we need to do research on occupational deprivation that deals with more of the complexity of, of the dynamics and in different situations and environments just how people are responding to that because in some ways what I've found is that people also can respond with great agency to a situation of occupational deprivation so a lot of work still needs to be done but I believe it's one of the most serious and important topics
that we can and should be developing in occupational science. So an example of a clinical application of understanding of occupational deprivation is through some work I've been doing with a team of occupational therapists who work in justice and forensic mental health network in a forensic hospital. So these are people who have been uh, involved in criminal activity but are found not guilty by way of their mental illness. So in the forensic hospital, it's a big institution and because of the environment in which risk is really uh, managed and controlled, there, there has been a situation where there has been quite a bit of occupational deprivation experienced by the patients there. So the team that I've been working with, occupational therapists, decided that actually they needed to focus on creating more occupational opportunities in that forensic hospital environment. So they took the concept and their understanding of what occupational deprivation is, why it's a risk for people, what the impacts of it are, and through that awareness and understanding, they then have modified their environment, they've changed the orientation of their service to become more occupation-centred, and rather than doing interventions that are more psychological in, in focus, they actually are creating whole occupational opportunities now to, to counteract what is an occupationally deprived environment. So for example, they've created a, a garden and in that gardening activity, the patients can actually earn a qualification in horticulture. They've set up a cafe with barista training and also a shop where the patients actually recycle used clothing. So from understanding the risks and impacts of occupational deprivation, they've completely changed the orientation of their service and the occupational therapy service delivery. Another concept from the occupational science literature is that of occupational transitions that I've been working on with several of my doctoral students and colleagues over time in different areas, but more recently looking at forced migration being a major and significant occupational transition for people uh, increasingly around the globe. So what we're looking at at the moment is investigating how the intervention of a life skills, community living skills program can assist people who are newly arrived refugees into Australia to journey through that transition more successfully and really engage in their community in a more powerful way over time. So that's work, that's research that's happening at the moment brings together the applied nature of the service delivery, but also will help our understanding of the nature and complexity and dynamics of occupational transition. So, teaching occupation. In many respects, we have an amazing resource available to us in teaching occupation, and that is the everyday worlds in which people live and do. So human society is a laboratory for understanding human occupation. And the best way for students to really understand occupation is to perhaps start with themselves and examine their own occupations of meaning and why they're meaningful and perhaps how their identity has been shaped by engagement in those occupations. But then I believe to go out in this, the human laboratory of society and access occupational narratives of other people in different contexts and people from diverse backgrounds and, and diverse ontological perspectives so they can begin to understand the deep complexity but also the very situated nature of occupation. So we're very fortunate in that regard that we have everyday 
life world, rich lived experience as you know a resource available for, for students to, with some structure, and for us to provide that structure for them to go out and really make those discoveries themselves with guidance, but to appreciate, and I think it should happen quite early on in their education, the richness of occupation and the extent to which it's always shaped by a cultural, social, political and economic environment. What an opportunity for students. Um, I believe occupational science has a great potential to support occupational therapy and, and research within uh, occupational therapy. Unfortunately, I don't think we maybe use it as, as much as we should. Um, we need to be more conscious of yeah, what is occupational science. And, and how we use it. Now I really realize there's a, there's a big difference between occupational therapy and occupational science. And uh, I think it's important to realize the differences too um, between these two, uh, I don't know if you call them professions, or between these two um, Discipline. disciplines. Yeah. But um, occupational science is something Bigger and I mean, it, occupational science is the study of occupation, and um, but it also is a study of occupation on different levels, um, not only an individual level. However, um, how do things in society affect occupations? Um, how do things in our law system affect occupations? In the environment, how do they affect? Them? I think which is really important, and that's different because in occupational therapy, a lot of times the classic occupational therapist would work from a medical model and work with individuals. I think that is evolving into, uh, we have different realms of, of the workplace. We don't have to work in a medical model. We don't have to work with individuals. We can be working with groups. Um, and I think our focus is more on the people that have issues with their, with their occupations. I decided to um, choose human occupation and occupational performance because a lot of times I think people kind of mix these up and think that occupational performance is, is human occupation. And I think we have to be, we have to realize what these concepts really mean and what does performance mean. Um, performance for me is just the doing of something, but an occupation is, is so much more. It's the, it's the doing, however it's also the being and the, and the belonging and the becoming. Um, and that, we can't, we can't lose that, those ideas within occupation. Um, and I think that's very important. I think a lot of times, especially in the field of occupational therapy, we concentrate um, mostly on the performance um, without thinking of, of these other concepts within the occupation. And I'm thinking, I'm reflecting about how I've worked as an occupational therapist. And I, I don't say <laughs> that I'm uh, perfect, that's for sure. But I think a lot of times we've tried to realize this in what we do. I can give some examples. I've worked with people with spinal cord injuries, with very high level spinal cord injuries. And um, they had no 
they had no ability to perform at all, actually, because they were totally paralyzed. And um, in, in Sweden, fortunately, you have the opportunity to be able to have a, a personal assistant. Um, and we would always try to infuse the idea into these people that they could, despite the, the fact that they couldn't perform, actually do, like doing something in the kitchen, they could belong and they could become, and they could, they could perform through somebody else. Um, that we would try to, if they were interested in working in the kitchen, we would try to get them to say, okay, you're the one that's the cook here, and I'm just doing it on your hands and your feet. And so this idea of performance is something that we really have to rethink really and try to get people more involved in, in occupations that are, that are meaningful for them. How people always think occupation and health, they kind of go hand in hand. And I thought that also for a number of years, but I really think we have to re-look at those, uh, that concept and those ideas because um, as we've heard um, this week at this amazing conference that we're mm -hmm. at um, here in, in South Africa, that all occupations are healthy. And I think we really have to look at not the occupations that most occupational therapists think of in terms of personal ADLs, instrumental ADLs, etc. I don't we can't we can't think in those terms anymore. It's too put in the box type of thing. I think we have to think of the dimensions, of the characteristics of an occupation. If you're engaged in an occupation, you do it, you do it wholeheartedly, but how is that connected to your health? And is it always good for your health? We're looking at um, people that are in a risk group to, for having a stroke in their occupations. A lot of their, or some of their occupations aren't always good for them. at the Karolinska Institute in, uh, outside of Stockholm, Sweden. And um, I teach the second term um, students uh, in a, in a three-year program. So they're still very relatively fresh and they, they don't know a whole, whole lot about occupation. And I think one of my most important roles as being a teacher uh, is teaching about, I don't want to call it occupational science maybe, but the importance of occupation and what occupation really means. And for them, it's still it's a very hard concept for them to understand. And they're getting things mixed up a lot of times. There's a lot of times they're still thinking in the medical paradigm and thinking if, if um, how important it is for a person to walk 50 meters or something. But they don't realize you know, where are they walking to and why are they walking there and what do they want to do when they actually walk there. And these are a lot of the taken for granted occupations that we do in our everyday lives that are in that we don't really think about until we can't do them. Um, and I think it's very important that uh, occupational students realize that we can. We can actually impact people's lives, and we can also, on a grander scale. I mean, I think we can impact on different levels, on different group levels, on legislation levels, societal levels. Um, I think we really have to rethink our ideas of of looking at individuals, looking even at in client constellations, as Ann Fisher might. Groups of people that are receiving occupational therapy. Um, it, it's it's very refreshing being a teacher because I learn so much from the students too, and I realize yeah, some of the problems. Are, and a lot of times, I I'd like to be able to uh, uh, help them more, but um, I, they have to learn by themselves. So they have to. And I think one of the most important things that as a teacher. Um, we can give the students the tools to reflect upon all these concepts, occupation, uh, occupational performance, occupational science, everything, and not always um, 
not always just accept things, to, to be real critical of the things that they're doing. And because I think they're going to need to do this, they're going to need to do this the rest of their professional lives, basically. Yeah, in my um, experience, it's very difficult to differentiate between occupational science and occupational therapy. So, occupation, or well, actually, I find it. I've got a clear idea, but I realize that in the literature, it's not, it's not as clear. Because, and that's what I often do with my students as well. That the differentiation between occupational science and occupational therapy, we often start there to to look at how different authors do that, um, because that then informs the understanding of what what we mean by occupational science when when we move beyond that. So, for me, I do believe that occupational therapists and occupational scientists both do research but that the difference between the two is about whether you are in a medical model um, or whether you look firstly at occupation. And for me, the, the, the best way to differentiate between the two is to, to look at occupation as a means, occupation as an end. And when I work with my students, I think the occupation as an end is if we do that, then we focus on occupational science. Um, now, I know it's different from some other contexts, um, but in South Africa specifically, we have to look at occupation as an end because there are so many people who are, by definition, they are medically healthy, they don't necessarily have symptomatology, physical or psychiatry, but they would still need to assistance with occupational issues. So because we in, in South Africa we have that kind of focus and occupational therapy, we don't focus as much on ADL and on function as that's why for us when we say occupational science, it often is the science that underpin work outside medical model contexts. So with people who do not have a, any health-related deficit. Occupational justice, injustice, very often the occupational risk factors. Our students learn about occupational risk factors in their first year because they need to start looking at why, or justifying why an occupational therapist becomes involved. And so often it would be that a playground in a community um, is not a safe space. And so the occupational therapists will work with whoever community members to ensure that the playground is safe so the children can engage in healthy play. Mm -hmm. You know, those kinds of... And for that, they need, they need the language of occupational risk factors and knowing that it, if, it, if, 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 these, if the children have to stay at home, be, the whole day with inside because there's violence in the area and it's not safe to go out, then they will experience occupational deprivation. So they have to learn that and of course that's connected with justice, injustice, with opportunities. Mm -hmm. We'll often find that in the area of occupational therapists will work with schools in areas that are um, where the schools again are under-resourced and maybe rather than again have a symptomatology we work with the classrooms, we'll work, they'll develop campaigns so that they can enrich their own classroom. So that's learning, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. So we're always dealing with occupational justice injustice.
right through. Um, that's a concept that informs occupational therapy all the time. Um, engagement and disengagement, I don't think to the same extent because in my experience, occupational disengagement often links to retirement in, you know, and, and, and very structured environments where people through the course of their lives will have almost a patterned or a predictable set of occupations. In our case, not always, not always so. And because our population is so young, we, we would very often talk about occupational opportunities, you know, for occupational, so occupational enrichment, um, to try and enrich. For example, there are projects that's been done with school-going children what they have available to them is not optimal. So during holidays, occupational therapists will, will offer occupational enrichment programs where they will have opportunities to go out and experience mm -hmm. um, doing things, participating, volunteering, you know, something that, that, is, that is over and above what would usually be available. Um, occupational balance is a very contested concept. We spend a lot of time in master's class trying to get to what that means, especially in our context. We've, we now have improved labor legislation, so at least people are no longer working many, many hours. It's legislated but so that you find a better... It doesn't stop people from working overtime so that they can earn more money, so they still do. Um, so you still find that people can have those that have work could spend um, long hours doing shift work. Um, in our context, also the transport to get from home to, especially for poorer people, because the the land is much less expensive and much more accessible further away out of cities. People don't have their own individual transport. We don't have an effect. Transport system. We do have a public health transport system, but people sit in minibus taxis or in buses for a long period of time to get to work. So they have a long work day, and then you have to add travel on both ends of the day. So very often workers in South Africa have imbalance. Um, not something that you address easily because it's their livelihood and it's what's available to them. And with an unemployment rate of 26.7, you don't say no to jobs because, yeah. So there's no shortage of people who would replace somebody if they decide to stop work. So for that reason, there's limited advocacy that one can do. But we do have really good labor legislation. So when people spend additional time at work, they will at least be reimbursed. But back to occupational balance, there are many people with occupational imbalance. Either those who are unemployed, which is a large proportion of them, which basically then have unfilled space. And I'm saying it's unbalanced because for them, they would want to work. You know, so based on their personal preference, their occupational repertoire is not what they want to It's, you know. And then on the other end, those who do work sometimes have so it's a big issue in South Africa, but not one that is easily addressed. I mean, you can't just sit with, it's, it's very often not within people's power to have a more balanced lifestyle. Um, that's what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say. Yeah, occupational performance in my mind, I would put firmly within occupational therapy. Um, because in the way we use the concept, it's very often connected with somebody's ability to function. <coughs> Whereas occupational participation is more an occupational science concept. So in, again, in South Africa, we, so we would go put performance is closely linked to ability, your ability to do and perform. Whereas participation is broader and that has to do with you know, engagement beyond. It's broader. So it's more connected with opportunities to be able to engage than it is with the physical ability to be able to do. So that is how we how we use it here. So then occupational science um, and research is mostly where I connect with it. Of course I teach it, which is 
easy, it's academic, mm -hmm. um, but I don't have a practice, so I don't practice it. But in clinical, my own field is in work. So my current research project, I think, is an occupational science research because it is about understanding the critical success factors for subsistence entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship or livelihood creation, um, we also call it micro-enterprise mm -hmm. in South Africa. Um, but the moment you put entrepreneurship and you search, that word means so many things. So I define it more clearly to say that it's about subsistence entrepreneurship. So I think livelihood creation is probably it's about those things that people do in order to ensure that they can put food on the table and sustain the family. Um, now, as, as occupational therapists in our context, we need much more information on what does it entail to do that occupation. Because very often, that is what people need when we engage with people or we partner with them in the community and we ask them what do you need that is what they need and so if we connect with them that is in, it is in that field that whether they're disabled people or other people who don't have a health condition but they face disabling conditions that's very often they need so i'm trying to do research or i'm doing research to look at what in our South African context, actually I'm lying, it's more it's broader, in Southern African context, what are the factors that, that make a, a project that, in which people work together to create livelihood, mm -hmm. what makes those succeed? Um, and so my research, we look at projects that's been around, a viable and, and, and uh, um, ongoing for longer than five years because my experience is we get donor money from the rest of the world start up a project when the money runs out the project dies mm. so now we're trying to find projects that have been running and viable and we do qualitative research and explore what is it about these that are that make them sustainable so that's my current research. So I've been teaching occupational science at all different levels for many, many years. So like I say, we now teach it to our first year students. And it has made a world of difference because initially when students started off in their first year, I found they didn't have a professional identity um, and they, they complained about it. They only started understanding occupational therapy maybe in their third year or in their fourth year. Um, and I remember one year a student said to me that we, they, the students felt that they were glorified babysitters, you know, in their first year and second year. So we now introduce occupational science concepts the very first when they hit the curriculum in first year they learn about the occupational human mm -hmm. so that is the first module and we basically give them all the occupational science um, factors about being a bit oh, theory about being and becoming and how doing shapes first of all identity but also say shapes health and wellness mm -hmm. and Opportunities, and we also bring the occupational justice concepts in that not everybody in South Africa has equal opportunity in order to engage, and the ramifications when you are limited in your opportunity to engage, and the fact that that will stifle development and meeting of needs. Mm -hmm. And then we bring in concepts of equity and equality, and how it is an important role for occupational therapists in South Africa to ensure that people have access to opportunity for them to be able to, to engage. And it's interesting how doing that then took away that, that, that professional identity issues completely. So the students, even in first year, they, will, they, have, um, they have no need to, be, to differentiate themselves from physiotherapy or medicine because they do it in any way. Mm -hmm. 
and we actually get feedback that they will, when they are doing joint work, that the other students will say to them that, well, you already know what it is you're going to be doing one day. So we, that for me was a really important thing. I also then obviously teach at a master's level or with, with um, occupational therapists in CPD, those that didn't have occupational science or occupational justice. Um, now, what I like to do is to use a movie. Um, yeah, so I have several movies that, that work really well. Um, and they can be movies in the popular movies where um, it was clear how occupations shaped. There's so many of them. At one point, we used how to make an American quilt with, with first-year students. But you can make, you can use anything that has music, or symphony, or choir. Or, there's so many movies, and then the, the students will watch that and will then reflect on how engagement in that occupation. Quite a part. There's no occupational therapist in the movie, but the doing of an activity and. Plus, in context, because they always, so the interaction with your human and non-human environment, um, and the non-human environment being around an activity or an occupation, how that shapes mm -hmm. the person and has a spin-off. So we, um, I like to do use movies, and so our first year students, they get asked to learn a new activity. We don't teach them the activity. Mm -hmm. They have to find a place where it is currently already happening and then they must go there and learn it there because we want them to learn it in context. So, and then they go and they make a, a digital story about it, um, occupational narrative of the person who teaches, somebody who's, who's teaching and then them learning it. So they have their own narrative and they have the narrative of the person who taught them that comes together. And then we also ask them to go and situate it elsewhere. So if I'm learning something from my grandmother, but now I also have to find a book or a movie or a story, artwork anywhere. It can be a painting, anything outside of the, the dyad, mm -hmm. which also illustrates what the doing of that activity, the impact that that has had on that person. So you'll very often read books in which somebody did an occupation and somehow it had an impact on them. So we, we, we try and get them, so not just the personal reflection thing, but that they actually start finding another example where they we want them to have that, mm -hmm. that focus where they also... So the important thing for me is that they learn that an activity has its own um, inherent demands but and inherent properties. Mm -hmm. But when you put it in a context, it also has the context in which it happens with other people. And there's so much that you can use from that. And then if you take it from there even broader, that there's the generalizable, in, you know, spin-offs from it, that um, people who do this activity in general, they mm -hmm. are these. So they learn to do an activity or analyze an activity at a macro level, so analyze the activity, but they also do a macro analysis of the activity, which mm -hmm. is the way this activity is usually done in context. Mm -hmm. It's usually done by these people, it usually involves that, and so to take it, yeah, so that's an example of what we do. This takes a long time because they get introduced to it in February when they um, start their first year and they do a presentation on this in September of that year. Somewhere between these two dates they submit their electronic story and it gets marked and they get some feedback. So they have enough time you know, to, to engage.